To return humans to the moon, SpaceX need to overcome the critical challenge of developing orbital refueling technology. Today, we'll explore how they plan to achieve this. Despite more than 80 years of acknowledgement that orbital propellant depots are essential for enabling affordable and sustainable missions beyond low Earth orbit, there has yet to be a serious effort to develop and deploy them. In fact, the concept has often faced strong opposition. Much of this resistance can be traced to two major misconceptions. The first is the belief that propellant depots are highly risky and would require extensive costly research and development just to determine their feasibility, let alone make them operational. The second misconception is the idea that building and maintaining orbital depots would be as complex and resource-intensive as the International Space Station. Framed this way, depots are frequently dismissed as expensive and risky diversions from the heavy-lift vehicle approach used during the Apollo era. Well, that changed in 2024 when SpaceX's Starship completed its third integrated flight and successfully demonstrated intravehicular propellant transfer in orbit. This milestone transformed the concept of orbital depots from a theoretical ambition into a tangible and increasingly practical solution, signaling that the era of sustainable deep space exploration may finally be within reach. What happened during that third integrated test flight was groundbreaking. Under a NASA tipping point contract awarded in 2020, SpaceX conducted a pioneering in-orbit propellant transfer demonstration aboard Starship. The objective was to transfer at least 10 metric tons of liquid oxygen from a header tank to the main tank of the Starship upper stage while in orbit. This marked a critical step toward establishing the infrastructure needed for orbital refueling. Another key aspect of the test was to better understand how propellant sloshing impacts Starship's maneuverability, as well as how to maintain settling thrust during docking operations to ensure stable and efficient fuel transfer. These dynamics are crucial for enabling reliable in-orbit refueling, especially during complex multi-vehicle missions beyond Earth orbit. Beyond the transfer test, the mission achieved several key milestones, including reaching its planned orbit and completing a full-duration ascent burn, both essential capabilities for Starship's future role in supporting Artemis lunar landing missions. This third flight was a milestone in SpaceX's plan to establish a space depot. Now that it's been achieved, the focus now shifts to what comes next. Nearly every upcoming Starship test flight over the next few years will serve objectives tied directly to enabling the first Artemis lunar landing. During these missions, engineers will closely study how propellants behave in microgravity, including measuring slosh dynamics, monitoring tank pressures, and observing how the fluids respond to impulses from the ship's small thrusters. Another critical area of focus will be the boil-off rates of cryogenic propellants, specifically liquid methane and liquid oxygen, in the vacuum of space. Without active cooling or insulation, these supercooled fluids naturally convert to gas over time. Understanding the rate of boil-off is essential for mission planning as it determines how much propellant can realistically be preserved and, in turn, how many tanker launches will be required to support a single Starship lunar landing. For its first full-scale orbital refueling demonstration, SpaceX will launch two Starships from Starbase, one designated as the target and the other as the chaser. The target Starship will launch first and enter low Earth orbit equipped with an upgraded power system and expanded battery capacity to remain operational for several weeks. Three to four weeks later, the Chaser Starship, acting as the refueling tanker, will follow. Once both vehicles are in orbit, they will autonomously rendezvous and dock in a unique belly-to-belly -belly configuration, flying several hundred miles above Earth. The docking ports used will be the same ones SpaceX currently uses to load propellant on the launch pad. After the physical connection is secured, SpaceX will adjust tank pressures and activate propellant settling thrusters to stabilize the transfer process. Refueling will then begin, with propellant flowing from the tanker to the target starship via pressure differential, forcing the liquid from the donor tank into the recipient tank. Following the in-space propellant transfer test, SpaceX will conduct an uncrewed demonstration mission of the HLS Starship 
This mission will involve fueling the vehicle in orbit and sending it to the moon for a landing. In addition to the landing, the mission will now include an ascent demonstration, a recent addition to the original plan, intended to prove that Starship can successfully lift off from the lunar surface. It's encouraging that there's a plan in place, but it's important to recognize the significant challenges ahead, which is to reach 5,000 subscribers. I'm just kidding, SpaceX don't face that challenge, but we do. And you can really help by subscribing right now, thank you. And let's get back to it. There are many reasons why orbital refueling between two spacecraft has never been done before. To fully refuel a Starship in orbit, multiple launches will be required. This is a direct consequence of the rocket equation. Rockets need fuel to carry both themselves and their fuel, which in turn requires even more fuel, creating a compounding challenge. So how many Starship tanker flights would actually be needed? According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, GAO, SpaceX's early estimates suggested that as many as 16 launches, including 14 refueling flights, might be needed to fully fuel a Starship lander and stage it in a specialized lunar orbit. These launches would be spaced roughly 12 days apart for each Artemis moon landing mission. However, Elon Musk pushed back on that number, calling 16 flights extremely unlikely. He believes that as the Starship design matures, each tanker could eventually deliver a full 150 tons of propellant to orbit. Based on that assumption, Musk says no more than eight tanker launches would be needed to refuel the depot ship, bringing the total number of launches, including the lander and the depot itself, to around 10. While that is still a significant number of launches, it's important to consider SpaceX's long-term goals for Starship. The future design aims call for multiple reuses of ships and boosters each day. Even if SpaceX falls short of those ambitious targets by an order of magnitude, Starship tankers could still feasibly launch every few days or at least once a week. Now that we've brought enough fuel up to the depot, the next challenge is keeping it there. Cryogenic fluids like liquid oxygen and liquid methane are routinely stored and transferred on Earth for industrial and medical purposes. However, handling these fluids in space is far more complex. Unlike on Earth, where gravity helps manage and control cryogenic liquids, the microgravity environment of orbit introduces a host of unique challenges for storage and transfer. One of the characteristics of cryogenic fluids is that if left unprotected, they gradually boil off over time. In space, boil-off of cryogenic propellants can be mitigated through both technological solutions and careful system-level planning and design. The rate of boil-off is influenced by heat leakage into the tank and the amount of propellant stored. Partially filled tanks experience higher percentage losses because heat leakage is related to surface area, while the initial mass of propellant depends on volume. According to the cube square law, this means that smaller tanks lose propellant more quickly than larger ones. Some tank designs have managed to limit liquid hydrogen boil-off to around 0.13% per day. For higher temperature cryogens like liquid oxygen, the boil-off rate is even lower, at about 0.016% per day. However, it is possible to achieve zero boil-off, or ZBO, through the use of active thermal control systems. In 1998, Tests conducted at NASA Lewis Research Center's Supplemental Multilayer Insulation Research Facility demonstrated that a hybrid thermal control setup could completely eliminate cryogenic boil-off. The test system included a pressurized 50 cubic foot, 1,400 liter tank, insulated with 34 layers of insulation, a condenser, and a Gifford McMahon cryocooler with a cooling capacity of 15 to 17.5 watts. Liquid hydrogen was used as the test fluid, and the tank was placed inside a vacuum chamber to simulate the conditions of space. Another NASA study from June 2003, conducted as part of a conceptual Mars mission analysis, showed that active zero boil-off systems offer mass savings over traditional passive-only cryogenic storage, depending on mission duration. For missions in low Earth orbit, ZBO becomes more efficient than passive storage after approximately 5 days for liquid oxygen, 8.5 days for methane, and 64 days for hydrogen. The longer the mission, the greater the mass savings. Cryogenic xenon, due to its properties, begins saving mass almost immediately compared to passive storage. Transferring fuel in space 
also presents its own set of challenges. On Earth or in any gravity field, the location of liquids and gases within a tank is stable and predictable. In microgravity, however, fluid behavior becomes far more complex and difficult to control. This unpredictability creates challenges in managing fluid flow during both pressure venting and propellant transfer, as the distribution of liquid and gas within the tank can shift in unexpected ways. Without gravity-driven buoyancy, thermal equalization within the liquid is also much harder to achieve than it would be even in a weak gravity field. For non-cryogenic storable propellants, solutions such as elastomeric diaphragms and surface tension liquid acquisition devices have been flight-proven to help separate liquid from gas. However, while there has been significant research into similar technologies for cryogenic fluids, the technology remains less mature and not as fully developed. Luckily, there are alternatives to developing techniques for manipulating fluids in microgravity, generally falling under the category of settled propellant handling. Research on cryogenic upper stages, dating back to the Saturn SRVB and Centaur, found that applying a slight acceleration, ranging from 10 to the negative fourth to 10 to the negative fifth g, can cause the propellants to assume a desired configuration. This allows many cryogenic fluid handling tasks to be performed similarly to those on Earth. The simplest and most well-established settling technique involves applying thrust to the spacecraft, which forces the liquid to settle against one end of the tank. This thrust can be provided by small rockets or by venting a small amount of boiled-off propellant gas through nozzles. Another proposed method, which ULA planned to test on the DMSP-18 mission in 2009, involves spinning the tank around its axis. In this technique, the propellant is forced against the tank's side walls, leaving a gas core along the axis of rotation. This provides continuous settling without the need to consume boil-off gases. Although an orbital depot is currently used primarily to support lunar missions, its potential is vast. By using a LEO depot or tanker fill, the size of the launch vehicle can be reduced and the flight rate increased. In a newer mission architecture, where a beyond-Earth orbit spacecraft also serves as the second stage, this can facilitate much larger payloads. This approach may help reduce total launch costs by spreading fixed costs across more flights, and fixed costs are generally lower with smaller launch vehicles. A depot could also be positioned at the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 1, EML1, or behind the Moon at EML2, which would reduce the costs of traveling to the Moon or Mars. Additionally, placing a depot in Mars orbit has been proposed as another cost-saving measure.